Hello and welcome to the Minority Arts Appreciation Society podcast, where we're taking all the boxes and bringing a minority perspective to popular internet discourse. Um, today, we're returning to 2021 boxes. What month are we in? I believe we're in April? That's all your court, buddy. <laughs> yeah, April. So, yeah, April. And for April, you know, last year, I believe it was last year, we did the 100 Gex remix album. I thought you know, it'd be fun to do. Remix albums have been surprisingly like on my radar each year, so I thought it'd be fun to do a um, another remix album. This year we're doing Paul McCartney's uh, confusingly titled McCartney Three Imagined. Like every time I read it, I feel like it should be reimagined. Um, I know, but it, it's imagined. It's pure <laughs> pretension. Like it's pure. <laughs> there's literally there's there's no reason. There's no reason. There's no conceptual reason why it's called Imagined. I also just realized, is he trying to draw a link between this and like the Len song Imagined? That's the only thing. And the, oh, the, the, <laughs> the only thing that entered my mind is that it was somehow a subtle jab at all the celebrities <laughs> that song Imagine. Because he was, uh, that's, the, oh, that's that all I could epic. come up with. And that's if actually it really is, good. That would be incredibly based like very good but i i don't know i don't paul mccartney is a very non-controversial popular figure (laughs) i think he is perhaps the most uncontroversial white man alive today (laughs) he's the only one who hasn't like recently done war crimes yeah and just in general just like it's like because even, even among even the people, Beatles, he doesn't have the same dirt on him that like a Lennon has. No, exactly. And like mm. obviously, R.I.P. George Harrison. Yeah. And like you know, G- George Harrison. I, I don't know. I I haven't heard anything bad about him. And Ringo Starr. Obviously, I feel like there's average Ringo <laughs> Starr haters, and like you know, based Ringo Starr lovers. Yeah, and so like I think the most truly neutral living beetle mm. and therefore white man because the beetles are the only white men <laughs> <laughs> the four That's... types of white guys yeah <laughs> yeah it's it, it's true it's so true oh my god um yeah i think he's i think he takes the title of like least controversial mm. i guess well... yeah I think I thought it'd be really fun to do this because you're a huge viewers fan. So I thought we—I f- yeah. don't know how much you dipped into his solo stuff. Um, I can tell you nothing. I, well, I, it, there's you one Paul say, McCartney solo why. song. The, my history with Paul McCartney, it, like his solo stuff, is I've been meaning to go back to listen to the McCartney two album mm. uh, from 1980 because there's a song called "Temporary Se- Secretary." Mm. which is absolutely mind-bogglingly wild and it's just like <laughs> why is paul secretly the weirdest member of the beatles like normal people don't make songs like temporary secretary dude is strange if you haven't heard that go listen to it and i think you hear shades of that on this album of like this is weirder than you'd expect from a 2021 paul project at points um yeah i i actually I'm, I'm but beginning to see what you mean. Another aspect of like my interest in this album was just the feature list is wild. Like it is, it's crazy. He, this guy, Paul, is what in his? How old is Paul now? King, like old dude. He was <laughs> he was around eighteen towards like the early sixties. So mm. what? That's got to be. I mean, like, getting seven, he's like seventy-nine 70 years ish. old. Oh shit! Oh, oh yeah, and, he's one of the older ones. Yeah. And like, obviously, this track list is trying to appeal to like the youngest generation, like try going for literally people our age. So, you know, I think Zoomers. he does like relevancy. I yeah, think he likes working with relevant artists and mm. feeling like his lineage is still like his influence is still there. He Definitely. can still work with new people because he is like surprisingly open-minded to the new shit like remember he had that huge song with rihanna and kanye yeah a few years back. Seconds. yeah and, but look at it, the track list like these aren't like obvious like, it's not like dua lipa yeah and no exactly it, it, it's like exactly. um dominic fike 
and um, Kerrang Bin. And Blood, like, Orange. Blood Orange, I was quite impressed to see. Like I was, Same. yeah, and it, quite and based. I was like, like how yeah. does he just read Pitchfork? Like, how is he picking these artists? Like, wh- how does he know of these people? You're too old to know about this. this yeah, this Zuma shit. Apparently, the story is he has like a friend, quote unquote, who sends him new music so he could stay up to date. Yeah. And so That's... it's very like trendy, right? These artists are very like trends that are kind of cool yeah. indie artists. Like they're not like lame kind of uh, surface level top forty stuff. They're that level of, I guess, like quote unquote indie mm-hmm. of like they're very popular. Like Phoebe yeah. Bridges is a massively popular artist. Yeah, but still with like a lot of artistic value. I guess yeah. would be the way to put it. I mean. Like they're like acclaimed current indie. Accl- yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they all have a lot of critical acclaim. Yeah. I'm not familiar with everyone on here. Mm. Uh, Dominic Fike, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't aware of. He was uh, on the, you've heard him. He's on the song uh, Peach by Kevin Abstract. See, dude, I, Spotify is the worst <laughs> streaming he sings the He sings the hook of that song. I'll be your baby doll and your bodyguard. Yeah. That guy. A lovely song, like mm. lovely, wonderful song, just not credited on Spotify. Just not credited. <laughs> RIP. Like honestly, it's like that. And like, oh, welcome to Tilly's segment of I hate Spotify. <laughs> but that that is like um a left field pick for like one of the lead singles of the album. Like mm. you, you have Anderson Pack on the album, and you went with Dominic Fike instead for like the lead kind of like pop yeah. R&B leaning single which is incredibly mm. strange and th- I don't know if you saw the video for Find My Way I did not so it's an amazing video it's basically a computer generated uh, recreation of young Paul McCartney uh, ah. dancing to, in a very like 2021 ass video like he's he's kind of walking it's, it reminds me a bit of of um, daydreaming? daydreaming video from Radiohead mm-hmm. where he's walking through rooms but the rooms keep rotating um, oh that sounds really fun and he's dancing but it's like it's literally young paul mccartney but like you know irishman computer generated Mm -hmm. i thought it was pretty good like it it has an uncanny effect which i think is partly intentional it's like really trippy and weird to watch him in like a modern context young uh but yeah i kind of like this um way of marketing paul mccartney because it's, I, I kind of like him as a legacy figure. It's weird to like just listen to a McCartney album. But like, for example, at the end of the Dominic Fike video, he basically has a cameo at the end where you see him reading the newspaper on a bench and he smokes <laughs> to the camera. And it's like, I like that kind of like Stanley energy, <laughs> like Paul yeah, McCartney yeah, I can, uh, I behind the scenes. Agree. Mm. Paul McCartney is an icon in, in like the most literal sense of the word. He should, mm. I, and I think that's a fantastic use of him. I, I because. Even bringing up, like, you bringing up his um, younger, like, the recreation of his younger image, it fills mm. me with nostalgia for an artist who I wasn't around for when they were young. Uh, yeah. It's a very powerful thing, just because the really? Beatles are so, again, in, in the most literal sense of the word, iconic. I, mm. I, I think there's a huge feeling of community in that. The Beatles are just such a universally beloved thing. And so I think it's really mm. like exciting when you get that it's, it's, earnest it's, coverage. Yeah. It's also super surreal watching the Find My Way video because it's of like, course, yeah. It's I have a like sort of cognitive dissonance between like the Beatles Paul McCartney and like the Paul McCartney we grew up with from like Pirates of the Caribbean part four, you know? Like, they don't feel yeah. like the same guy. And you no. watch his video, it's like, man, it's, this is the same guy. Like, yeah. He's just yeah, yeah, about, he's just a bit more wrinkly and grey. Yeah, exactly. But, like, this is the exactly. same dude. Yeah. But anyway, getting into the, uh, the album. The music, yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll, let, I'll, I'll let you start, because obviously, you know, your history is very simple. You are a huge Beatles fan, but also a bit familiar with the Paul McCartney solo stuff. Yeah. Um, so... How are you feeling on this? Like, like, was this embarrassing and weird, or was it something more palatable? I think. Hmm. Well, 
I think palatable is potential is probably the best word for this. Mm. It's. I think I think the the quality of this album, which I'll get into, has a lot of very interesting implications, which are more interesting than the album themselves. Like I really like thinking about this album as a portrait of where Paul McCartney is now as like a pop culture figure, uh, because I think this album is super interesting as when I think of it as a collection of artists going like, oh, okay, I have this like, I guess opportunity, not 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 for like publicity or anything like that, but opportunity to like stake my claim on a massive part of musical history, not that McCartney 3 is like an essential album, but to work with yeah, and be like... it's still Sir Paul McCartney. It's Sir Paul McCartney, like mm. to, 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 yeah, be a part of one of the most significant artists of the modern era of like the 20th century and onwards uh and the music itself um it varies from like an interesting take on Mm. what i assume is a pretty okay paul mccartney song Mm. to like i'm not into this kind of thing and Mm. it's i found it quite frustrating uh because i think So, to compare it to another remix album that we've done, which I called a platform for, like, artists within this scene to kind of show Mm. what they're doing, which is A Thousand Gex and The Tree of Clues, and how every artist on that album, I feel, um, has their moment to show who they are, whether that be good or bad. So, like, I think Dorian Electra represents themselves very well on that album by making a pretty generic pastiche hyperpop song and vice versa i think injury reserve incredibly Mm. it show how incredibly versatile they are by jumping on a hyperpop song and fucking killing it um unlike this album where i kind of felt that a lot of artists were almost doing a pastiche of themselves uh, mm. But to name names, I found Josh Holm uh, and Beck to be particularly like cloying attempts at just sort of capturing their general vibe, basically, mm. uh, which mm. was really disappointing. And you have artists doing some more interesting stuff, and obviously artists who I'm less familiar with, like Phoebe Bridges, I can't say mm. are doing that same thing. Uh, so yeah, I hope I hope that th- those collection of thoughts is fairly encapsulating. But I, but ultimately, it's a bit all over the place because I found it yeah extremely palatable, extremely like okay, this is like <laughs> human music. Hmm, I like I guess, this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess like I like the comparison to Andrew Gex because yeah, that album very much feels like platforming a scene. Yeah. Whereas this album feels more like a conversation between generations. Like, mm-hmm. especially watching the Find, Find My Way video. Yeah. If you look at the kind of dancing that this, like, computer Paul is doing, it's very, like, hip, modern dancing. And it's an attempt, I think, on Paul's angle to imagine the surreal strangeness of, like, what if I was this huge pop star in today's world? You know, what would that look like? Versus, like, being that in the 60s. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of this album is trying to imagine excuse the use of the word that kind of reality <laughs> through kind of like these popular kind of new artists right um mm, mm. but i think totally this album really clicked for me when i kind of compared it a bit to what we did last week with assault and precinct 13 where yeah. i think this is basically to like b movie thriller movies as a precinct is i think this is that for like corny pop albums <laughs> and I think the joy in this album is when it tries to ape the um, kind of Beatles-esque kind of tonal stuff. Like, I think the Caesar Day Phoebe Bridges, I think, is really going for, like, classic Beatles sound. Oh. Um, I think that really doesn't work, actually. Um, but when it's going for, like weirdo 80s electronic disco funk Paul McCartney I think it's really fun and I really dig it um and there's really like pokey 
playful yeah, yeah like deep right. down um and i think a part that like really like that i really dig that really got this across to me was um the track pretty boys um uh, pretty boys is a banger, it's, banger. It's, a really, it's a really great song and there's a play playfulness to the song's lyrics whereas the remix versions are very like yeah. willingly playful and and jokey and like he does this it. like vocal thing yeah. yeah where he's like like um find my way it's like i can find my way i know my left from right like it feels like a theatrical showman <laughs> cheesy 80s like disco character yeah, like even um deep down not deep down is it deep down? Yeah, even deep down it feels like something that could have been like like a boogie nights. Like there is something wow. like sleazy and playful to this. So I did the stuff that is aping that like funky disco 80s weirdo pool. Okay. I really dig. And the stuff that's going for like trying to imitate the more soulful Beatles y pool is ex- like, quite boring to me. Okay, that's see what I quite like this. I quite like that we're coming at this from two such different places because mm. for me, well, I, I think we're sort of covering all bases because I think remix albums, yeah, it's really difficult because you kind of can't really say they stand, they, they should stand on their own. But I did intentionally mm. come at this from a very like cold perspective. I just wanted to see if I could mm. jump in and see and uh, let let what these artists tried to collaborate on doing uh, mm. speak for itself to an extent. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's good that we have your angle of more relating it back to that early stuff because, yeah, I think I think Pretty Boys translates incredibly well to what they're doing because I think, well, number one, I think I think Paul is a very was 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 a very cute beetle. I think he's he he does cute <laughs> very well. And yeah, he was like, the pretty boy of the Beatles. He, he yeah. was the pretty boy of the Beatles, like yeah, mm. exactly. And I think what has been done by Krangbin is mm. so fantastic for that because it's this incredibly loose, playful thing, which I think I said I said it works better because I think I think it gets across that insidiousness a little bit more of like yeah it's very accurate to the way that they were presented in the times it was like oh mm. look at these wacky playful boys like look at them mm. and actually they were like you know i mean obviously they were a massively privileged rock band but also at the same time mm. like the human condition of that the human experience of that like yeah it can't just be ignored like it was this probably actually deeply strange experience being some of the first pop stars uh and yeah i mean they, i really they like much embody how we think of musician celebrities now. exactly like it is everything came off the beatles as an imitation of beatlemania like yeah down to like one direction no completely and i i really like what the sound of that song does with that like it's such an earworm uh it's a fantastic like it's such a great mm. song um i think it feels like lounge music yeah it's oh it, it's so it's like very sleazy in that way. It was like something you'd hear in like a, a massage parlor. <laughs> no, yeah, because <laughs> it's really uh, <laughs> such a weird direction. It was a really important song in how I like came to process how I feel about this album because the first time I listened to it, mm. I was kind of just dealing with the concept of this in the first place. <laughs> so like <laughs> stuff stuff stood out a lot less. I would say like yeah. I kind of. I was kind of just like, oh, okay, this is happening, this is happening. I, and I was almost constantly thinking about the last song that I'd played as each song started playing. And, mm. but then, yeah, I heard Pretty Boys and I was like, I almost can't fucking believe that a song that sounds like this is on a McCartney record, like remix or not. And, mm. and that is really interesting. Like, I, I do think that's really interesting. And obviously... On this podcast, we do make a bit of like a qualitative things like that. But I think also a lot of the time what we talk about is just quality or whatever that is aside. What's good to talk about? Like, what does this bring up or make you think of that is interesting? And like I said at the beginning of sort of my introduction, this opinion, this I love listening to this album and just thinking about different artists approaching this and what. The, 
what this all means. So I really like what you brought to the table with like the um, conversation between two generations of of popular artists. Yeah, I think like a really good example of that conversation is is the most having listened to the original album as well. Mm. Most of the songs are like direct copies of the lyrics. Most of them are not messing with the original authorial intent, as it were. Yeah. The only song that is like a major departure, and it's the lead single which is telling, is Kiss of Venus with Dominic Fike, which I think works really well for me at least because it, it feels like a Dominic Fike song. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't feel like a Paul McCartney song. So it has this real like distinct personality. Like I, I quite enjoy Dominic Fike. Um, I haven't heard all of his music, but I think he's got like a... F- very in very Brockhampton fashion, got quite like a cool, lackadaisical quality to his voice, but also like delving into that like emotional side. The, and yeah, the Kiss of Venus definitely stands out as like it does it the in terms of Paul. Mm, and, and in terms of like songwriting, like what it's about, the idea of like it's very teenage, like the idea of like the news is crazy, what's happening in the world around us crazy, and trying to use that as like breaking the ice is someone you're interested in like hey what's your take on it like you know what's your opinion on, on what's happening right now and like very like there's a very like boyish charm to that which i think is like does remind me of like a cut from like early beatles you know but which is all about you know these teens just trying to like you know spark like conversation with someone they fancy or yeah you know i want to hold your hand but the kiss of venus you know they're kind of breaking the ice of like talking about politics and the news um, so 2020 baby. maybe is yeah is like a contemporary reading of that kind of like boyish charm of like early beatles so stuff like that like really interesting like reinterpretations of like the beatles project um i i think mm. i think what that's brought up is that's really interesting is how separate is paul mccartney's post like beatles career <laughs> separate from the mm. beatles i mm. think that's one thing and so when I, that's why I brought up like how significant it is having all of these artists contribute because mm. it doesn't feel so much like they're, yeah, doing their take on Paul McCartney. It's it's more like they're, mm. they're doing their take on the Beatles because so much of his career, I think is, I mean, just of course it is in the light of, of the Beatles, like, I don't think you can be in that band and not write about it, at least in a couple of songs on your albums for the rest of your life. And mm. I, I, I think it's really interesting just seeing what works and what doesn't. You, what, you, what surprised me was um, you brought up that the Phoebe Bridges song, Seize the Day, reminded you of the Beatles, which, or at least to, you know, capturing some essence of that, which I didn't yeah. get at all. I found it, mm. but I think we, I think we didn't like it for the same re- reasons, or at least that was the vibe I got from you. Yeah, well, I feel like it's going for like kind of the, um, with the the guitar riff in the middle and the kind of like marching band vibe. It feels like it's aiming for the spirit of like the okay. kind of sixty five era Beatles of kind of like epic, slightly conceptual weirdo song. Yeah, um, this is extremely boring. I'll get. Yeah. Onto that more later, I guess. Ooh. I um, I think, but I think, I think, but I think even like "Find My Way," I think functions in the same way as um, the opening of the um Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band. But you know that album opens with kind of like this farcical um image of this band who's gonna like cure all of your ills and be this thing <laughs> to escape into and this kind of has a similar vibe it, it almost reminds me of like uh it's very disco very funky it reminds me of like the, Je- the jesse Ware album from last year with, mm-hmm. with you know paul inviting you to um i know you're overwhelmed by anxieties let me help you out let me be your guide like it is going to like, the total escapism of like yeah. band fanaticism but like making a complete farce of it again so i think i do like what you're saying about how much of the beatles writing bleeds into poor stuff i think that kind of satirical look at like the role of the pop star and how farcical it is does bleed into here and i think even in the original version of that song find my way it does feel a lot more like chaotic and anxious as if paul is trying to convince himself that he is paul mccartney and he can be the showman whereas in the remix of beck it feels very like composed and like he's there it's very sleek and modern the image Um, is really confident yeah so i like i like that interplay as well for me so i'm a huge beck fan 
um for mm. his early stuff at least as you probably <laughs> know um because yeah. there's a part where it all goes really bad <laughs> yeah he um, got sad and made a breakup album and then never could make good music recovered. after that and never recovered dude, <laughs> extremely boring up. breakup album that probably inspired like most oh. sad indie boy albums oh. in the 2000s oh, you have him why to <laughs> why oh. um, but I, I i i love the lackadaisical quality of his first three albums like i just think they're wonderful mm. things uh yeah. and and, and uh, but for me so you found all this stuff but like as a beck fan like it came on and i just thought oh yeah. okay this is a beck song like this is cool mm. it's beck doing the beck thing um same with like i brought up before josh Hom. like i i found yeah. these two to be like they're not my least favorite tracks that's why i'm bringing them up briefly now but i just found these to be really like cloying and just like yeah. especially josh Hom's one which i was just like come on dude you are it, it, this that, in. that's another example i think of the artist who's brought on trying to make a beatles song because that's so abbey road it's so yeah, trying it's to insane. sound like a, a polyphene pam and me mr mustard in his defense the original song is extremely abbey road and trying to do like a polyphene pam me mr mustard kind of storytelling track yeah um, but that yeah. was a really lame track yeah, really lame really lame one thing that's interesting about Laboratory Lil is apparently it's been speculated that it's about his um, Paul's ex-wife, but there's no like evidence <laughs> to back this up. But it does have like that extreme vibe. curmudgeon ex-wife guy energy, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like just very dissenting. Um, also, just the title "Polythene Pan mm, Laboratory Lil." It's so yeah. it's so it's in really going for that trilogy. Man. Yeah, but yeah. I think an another one that. Another one that I found disappointing in terms of like this is just the artist doing the artist thing because mm. sometimes it really worked for me. Like Krong Bin and Dominic yeah. like was that, but those are really good for me. Whereas like okay. the Saint Vincent one, um, if you compare it to yeah, and it's, I was actually excited for the Saint Vincent, but if you compare it to the original, it's literally the same song as the original song, just like um, Daddy's Homified. Like she I, just I, added the uh, yeah. the exploitation like background vocals oh, and like sleaziness. Am. Yeah, exactly. And, and the, the worthy guitars. And like that was kind of it. And it was just extremely like uninspired. Dude, it's like a remix. I <laughs> haven't heard the original. And I was like, I, I'm genuinely certain this sounds so much like a solo Paul McCartney song. But this is, mm. I literally came to that same conclusion. I was like, this mm. literally sounds like St. Vincent just doing what she's doing right now. Like, <laughs> and that's what I mean. It, like, there's interesting yeah. stuff going on here. But at the end of the day, I think there are quite a few tracks. Where I feel like Versus. they were like, uh, I can't really say no to Paul McCartney. Like, I yeah. should probably just do this remix. <laughs> Which is really surprising because I feel like. I feel like some of the artists really went their own way. <laughs> like, yeah, no, like the, good the, for them. The, the 10 minute long 3D RDM track, which is like this epic, moody, like synthy electronic bit, which I actually really enjoyed. It's like borderline, like a house suite. Like, it's, it's yeah. really wild. And that is reflective of his, his weirdo 80s electronic stuff. But that, that mm -hmm. definitely felt like interesting, experimental, and not pandering y in, in yeah. that way and it also really dug but and i think the one example of like a successful aping of a classic beatles paul mccartney mm. written track mm. is i think when people think paul mccartney beatles they think like blackbird right like those types of songs the sentimental yeah. soft songs and i think the, the when winter comes with um anderson pack and matt demarco in production re i think re really captures like what a blackbird style song would sound like in uh, today's climate Oh, anyway, it's yeah. really breezy, really nice. Like, I really dig. It's not like a huge standout, but it's a really chill, lovely, wonderfully produced track. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just imagining Paul McCartney in his room calling Matt DeMarco and Anderson Pack, like, hey, kids, hey. you want to make this album? <laughs> hey, salad days guy. <laughs> you tired of your cigarettes yet? <laughs> I need you to make a song for me. Anyway, fantastic. Also, imagining Paul McCartney in his room listening to like extremely funny to me. <laughs> listening to who? Sorry, Phoebe Bridges. <laughs> Crying, extremely <punishment>. funny. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, oh man, like, I understand oh. the plight of the mid twenties. <laughs> <Suburbanite. laughs> 
I yeah. no, I think I think Paul McCartney is. I know he's such a dad rock figure, and I and like I get that. Like he is a bit of a relic, but I I yeah. think there is quite a lot of him that's applicable to today. I think a surprising amount yeah. when you when you dig a little bit deeper than just like how people joke about him uh, in day to day life. I do see, and you know, pointing out he's a dad rock figure. If you look at this album, there's a real like wholehearted attempt to not make a dad rock album he did yeah. succeed which is fascinating the ed o'brien track was one i found really weird i really like sliding the ed o'brien track it's i think what? it's a really fun song i think it's fun i, think it's I fun. don't know man those fucking <laughs> vocals absolutely uttered it oh see because i think they're like very playful and funny like a b-movie way no oh, <laughs> like oh, it's like the rock and roll that is such oh, a the lion, brain take the lion, i can see my body through the windows of my hair i'm sliding gliding through the air like how is that not funny like this image of like paul mccartney this like 80 year old man <laughs> flying through <laughs> the air like, looking at his body like rub sliding right now it just is so cringe <laughs> the vocals are so like overblown really mm. like that like that kind of American slant of like hell yeah, and it's like oh dude, I feel like I'm listening to a Patriots anthem for some reason. It's really like cool. It's... it's corny. It's not so much cringe. It's super corny and corny. Can I guess I like I like the corniness. I think yeah, it's really you you love a bit of corn. You love you yeah. You can, you can make corn into your own. I mean, it sounds more anyway. like a Stone Age track than the the Josh Homme track, did. Uh, I don't. Mm, yeah, it does. Yeah. It's got the ch- it's a chugga chugga guitars. It, yeah, no. Th- that's the thing is, I actually really like all the instrumental elements for it. Josh, Josh should have sung on that song, like absolutely. Yeah, I thought I that was the homie that. track. I mean, huh? Also, how do you feel about the Damon Albin track? Because that's one I was really disappointed oh, in. It's fine. I was expecting like, I don't know. I was expecting like a Beatles. Not Beatles, a Paul McCartney Gorilla track. And I'm no, like, bro, exactly. that's banging. I, and then it was very, it's very ponderous and very dull. I think the best compliment I can give it is the instrumental sort of sounds like a post apocalyptic, like technical, technologically advanced area, like a Chrono Trigger, like GRPG yeah. from SNES. I like guess yeah. kind of, and it's kind of got like Bowie, you know, low vibes, like the second yeah. half of low, yeah. the chanting. But it is yeah. like a less interesting version of like of what I think deep deep feeling does no exactly i think there's honestly really good parallels between i don't i gorilla's songwriting and beatles songwriting um Mm. and i i think i I, yeah i i had high hopes for it just because i think damon alvin can do really interesting things but it's not 2010 anymore Kind of thing. I don't think he's <laughs> at that stage. Like I like the new know, mean, record, but it's not. It, yeah, it's not it had good beach, songs not... on it. But it Exa- wasn't, ex- yeah. Exactly. That's that's my thing with it. And and I mean, it's to me, I don't like that song as much. I don't like Long Tailed Winter Bird as much as yeah. like the good songs on that record. And it yeah, it, it's I I'm just repeating myself at this point. But it's it's another one of those songs where I was like. And this is actually really similar to how I feel about Damon Albarn on mm. the new Gorillaz record. Is it's Damon Albarn doing the Damon Albarn thing, and yeah. I'm just like, okay, we get it, we get it. Like you're okay. you're doing your thing. Like it's not, it's like the inverse of what we were talking about on the A Thousand Gex review of like mm. staking your claim. It's like phoning it in instead. It's just like for for me, that's how it feels. Of like you you're coming at it it's seemingly to me as like yeah. a, i've got to do this fucking remix song let me just knock it out i'll just do my usual thing no here send it to my producers here you go paul that's well, you yeah to bring it out to paul i gotta say i gotta i gotta give props to this guy's vocals i think this guy's nearing 80 and i think he still gives some really fun theat- theatrical explosive vocals like i really love on on deep deep feeling um I always got like cheesy Bowie vibes when he's like, here in my heart, I feel a deep devotion. It almost hurts. <laughs> it's such a deep emotion. Like it's very like playfully simple and silly. And like the original version sounds more sincere and sad, but this new one, it, it does feel like 
if in Black Dynamite he had like a sad scene at the end, we have to explain what an emotion was, and he just keeps <laughs> saying like, you know, this deep emotion, emotion. Like it's just, <laughs> I, really, I really love how weird and playful Paul. There's no self seriousness in this, and I, I think that's what I like about Paul Soda stuff. I think I, I love Lennon Soda stuff, but Lennon is extremely self serious, extremely self serious, and I think Paul always had like a, you know, self deprecating kind of cheeky streak to him which i really enjoy absolutely he's a very cheeky guy i think vocally i i completely agree i to go back to the beatles um i love his like o- almost his little characters that he does with his voices um like always mm. one of my favorite beatles vocals moments is um mm. the part in uh you never give me your money where he goes out of oh. college money spend pay no <laughs> future so like it's like who is this man like, <laughs> this crazy like, guy and, yeah and i think like um it speaks to how well john and paul complimented each other as as vocalists because John mm. had his thing, and it was this beautiful, ethereal... I mean, you know, fuck, whatever. John Lennon, cool, 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 but I'm going to compliment him now. Uh, like his, It's his... okay, you won't get cancelled for I, liking John Lennon I don't, sometimes. You, ne- <laughs> you never know, buddy. You never know. <laughs> I understand. Sorry. <laughs> it's also, like, very exhausting to do background checks on every person who writes a song that you like. Kind yeah, of. exactly. Absolutely. But, but I understand the fear, yeah. Yeah, um... He he has this beautiful ethereal thing going on, and Paul Paul is just this again, like cheeky, wonderfully charismatic singer. Like he's really down mm. to earth. I feel like I, I I can the way I get the way I guess if I was gonna give like a metaphor, I can, as I I can really see like Paul sitting at a piano at a party and giving a good old like sing song, and everyone just being really into it because he's really like fun and charming performer mm. uh yeah. and that's that's what i really love about paul mccartney as well as like his more tender like he's an incredibly tender singer as mm. well um mm. so like i i'm always as a huge beatles fan and as someone that like mm. loves all of that stuff i love hearing more paul i think he's i think i just i think he's kind of great in like Mm. not as in like i think he puts out like a a great album every time because like you know i mean i I just i'm not familiar with a lot of his solo stuff but i think yeah i think he's an incredibly charming performer yeah i agree he's very charming very likable um never descended into into like pure grumpy old asshole bullshit like he seems very open-minded very nice even recently in the news we had um Matt Damon admitting that it was only this year that did, did he figure out that he shouldn't say the F gay slur because his daughter was like, "Hey, Dad, maybe don't say the F gay slur." And he was like, "Wow, what a concept!" Wow, you twenty twenty kids, <laughs> you're so politically correct. <laughs> oh wow! Oh, so like considering, I don't know, I feel like Paul is, is a better yeah. head on his shoulders than he maybe should at, at such an old age. Like, I yeah, he's yeah, he's, he's all right. I'm sure, I'm sure he has dirt in his closet, but. Publicly, he has done a yeah. good PR job at seeming all right. Ex- exactly, exactly. <laughs> anyway, let's go on to a favorite new favorite tracks. Uh, I'll go first. Mm-hmm. Um, first favorite track is a uh, Kiss of Venus uh, featuring Dominic Fike. I talked a lot about this in the episode. I really like the song. I just think it's really fun. I can imagine um D- Brockhampton playing a verse over this, and um, I really like the chip tune vocalizing at the end of the track actually works for me it reminds me a bit of like frank ocean when he uses chip tune vocalizing mm. uh i wish the track did it end so abruptly because i really enjoyed it second up we talked a lot about it we have pretty boys uh the the kiran bin song i hope i'm pronouncing that properly it's a very weird I, name I, i've heard it as like krang bin krang like, bin yeah again yeah not 100% super cool sure. track uh it feels like reminiscent of like stoner psychedelia with hints of like the 50s exotica atmosphere um i really love how like spacious and groovy the song is mm-hmm. um and like i think it builds the album out in a really nice way like it just has a lovely texture to it and another thing it reminded me of was a bit of like the hotline miami soundtrack um <laughs> reminded me of like a sonora songs in that soundtrack like horse step in which have that really like spacey drugged out like loungy vibe which i 
read it because I really love that song. And then finally, um, Deep Down featuring Blood Orange, I think is like totally slaps. I love like mm-hmm. the weird, funky, groovy 70s pool energy here um, or like early 80s even. Uh, and I love like the flamboyant uh, performance that Paul gives, you know, I want to get deep down. I want to do it right. Like it's it's extremely <laughs> funny. Party all the night. Like it's it's, it's very good to me. I, I really deep, like it. Uh, oh. And oh, then my least yeah. favorite track is Seize the Day featuring Phoebe Bridges. Uh Lay it on me, me out because I like Phoebe Bridges. I was looking forward to this. But man, this is like the most dull, most bland track on the album. I know you disagree with me that it feels like it's trying to do a Beatles thing, but it does feel like uh I've seen people online talking about how this is like one of the tracks on this album that feels more reminiscent of classic, like trying to do the Beatles thing. And, um, but it feels like a fake off brand Beatles song or like a bad knockoff Beatles rock band game, you know? Yeah. yeah uh, like yeah, it just, yeah. it just feels really out of place here. And I feel like there was a level of quality, like standard of quality that was like came of like most of these songs that this mm-hmm. is like really fell short of. So yeah, I think I do think the middle part of this album is just kind of like ooh. it's but, pretty um, it's pretty rough. But anyway, man, I honestly I was I was expecting this to be awful and like a very funny episode of how bad this is. But <laughs> I, I enjoyed uh, a lot of this album yeah. and 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 I'd give this a decent recommend. Like it okay. was just it it was a weird experiment that goes over so much better than it should have. Uh and I, I, know, I'm, I, I dig it. Mean. So cool. I'm, I'm into it. <laughs> I think, yeah. Uh, so I'll start off with um, When Winter Comes uh, is one of my first favorite track. Uh, immaculate vibes as a, as a mm. Beatles. When, Josh, when you brought up Blackbird, I mm. like, I, okay, Black, Blackbird is like one of my all time favorite songs. Mm. Um, so like, I'm not saying it's, it is that level, but as a, as a really Beatles reminiscent track with just that m- melancholic yet completely tranquil feeling. Mm. Oh, this really served it for me. And particularly coming from an artist like Anderson Pack, I I mm. love, I love how he brought his own flavor to that. Second up, I'll say Pretty Boys said a lot about this song. Josh is another one of fav- Josh's favorite songs. So just a great track, just like really good. Um, and finally, yeah, Deep Down. Deep down, oh, 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 dude, I, I was like, what the fuck is Blood Orange going to do with a, with a Paul McCartney song? What is he going to do? Bro. And like, uh, I was listening to it and I was like, actually, I'm so fucked up over how like <laughs> grooving I am right now. I'm so <laughs> grooving right now, dude. Like, it's, oh, like, please, honestly, like, I'm doing such a bad job of actually describing it. Please just put it on and just, like, <laughs> wiggle about in your chair and you'll have, like, a really good time. That's the best way I can describe it. Finally, yeah, really my cool. least favorite song um, is The Kiss of Venus. I find this song, like, oh, man. to be super, like, it's in this vein of song of, of genre for me. And like, this is coming from someone who like has no idea who Dominic Fike is, mm. but I find really cloying and like grim. And it's that like post Rex Orange County, like, <laughs> like kind of just, it's pure grooviness. It's pure. Like they've got that like twangy guitar, not in a Mac DeMarco way, but in like a, mm. yeah, exactly like in a very Brockhampton way. And like mm. it plays super well and goes over like cool TikTok compilations or whatever. And I just it's a pet peeve. But when I heard it, I was like, oh, and I think it and and I think it sticks out in a really annoying way. In terms of recommendation, I don't know what the fuck to say. Um <laughs> it's like fine. Like again, I think there are some genuine bangers on here. Like some like today I was listening to it and I was actually incredibly surprised at how much I liked some of these songs and like pretty boys is like probably going to be like a go-to like conversation background song uh i give it i'd say i'll give it overall like a week recommend if you are just generally interested in beatles iconography and paul mccartney himself uh, one last thing i'll add before we wrap this up is apparently out there is an idris elba remix of of long-tailed winter bird uh that Yo. is like i don't think it's on the main album but it exists 
<laughs> Paul McCartney like asked for it, and it's out there. I haven't heard it. I, I just want all this to know that this happens. This is the okay. I'm tracking this down. That's crazy. <laughs> I mean, because the the original, the one we have on this album is is so fucking mediocre. <laughs> it's so nothing. Cool. So what are we? What do we? What do we? What do we try on next week? Well, next week is another music switcheroo episode. Uh, oh obvious. shit! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm really excited. Um, I love doing these. And I'm going to be taking us over to uh, a Taiko Onuki record. Uh, City pop is something that I have wanted to get into a lot more because it's it's something that I, I see no reason for me not loving it. Uh, mainly because uh, Taiko Onuki is an artist that I'm not hugely familiar with as well. Uh, but Carnival uh, is such an incredible pop song to me. Like, it's completely flawless. Um, I just want to sit in that album's last two, I mean, that in that song's last two minutes for an eternity. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the album from which Carnival ha- hails, which is Romantique. And that's it. Sweet. So um, yeah. the next time we're talking about Taiko Anuki. Yeah, and, we um, are. Yeah, I think we've uh, ticked all the boxes. We so. have indeed. Paul McCartney, if if uh, if you hear this, uh, I hope you're doing well. <laughs> yeah, thanks for Abbey Road. That was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good moment. Yeah. Hot take: Abbey Road, good. Um, <laughs> also, <laughs> your songs on the White Album, eh, some of the best ones. So, yeah, yeah com- <laughs> very completely cool. fair. Very based. Thanks, King. <laughs> this is a good look for you. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.